Now that we've built up our nomenclature regarding relations and Cartesian products and sets and ordered pairs, I want to go back and investigate a concept that we're familiar with before, which is the concept of a function. And we're going to try to take that concept, we're going to try to understand it well and recast it in our new language. So let's take, for example, f of x equal to x squared, a function we've undoubtedly seen before. And if I asked you to describe what f of x equal to x squared might be, one answer that you might give me is you might draw the graph of this particular function. But I want to sort of visualize what is really going on here for this graph of f of x equal to x squared. Well, the way I want you to think about it is I have this horizontal axis, this is my x-axis, and I have the vertical axis, this is my y-axis, and for every input value x, that you think of it, x is going as, a, as an input to this function, it spits out some particular height here. So in other words, you have that your x is an input, and that sort of goes into this, this function machine. And then that, what happens is that it gets squared, and then it spits it out as an output over here. So that is going to be my idea of a function. It's got this input and it's got this output. Now, you might have recalled that to be a function, you have to pass something called the vertical line test, which this does. If I write my vertical line test, there's only a single intersection point here. So what was that about? Why was that a requirement? The reason why we had a vertical line test is that if I have some input, I want my function to output one particular thing. I want to know that if I, if I give it one thing, it's going to spit out at me one thing. I don't want it to spit out a whole bunch of different possibilities and I don't know what is happening. I put an input, I expect to get out an output. So that's what the vertical line test tells you. It tells if there's one input, there has to be at most one output for it. And the other condition that we had for functions was that we wanted to have that in the domain, which in this case, the domain is all the input values, which is all of the different real numbers. We want to know that the function actually does something for everything in the domain. If the domain is all of the input values, we want to know that for every one of these different x's, the function actually goes somewhere. And this is true for this function. No matter what the x is, its output is going to be, it has a prescription for what its output is going to be. Another intuitive picture for how we can think of a function is literally as a machine. In other words, I'm going to imagine that I've got some sort of machine here, and I'm going to call this machine the x squared machine. This is the squaring machine that takes a number and squares it. And there's two different components here. First of all, I'm going to have an input. And I want to think about it that my input is going to come from my, and my, here's my fancy math word, my domain. Domain is just my name for the set of all of the possible inputs. So this number comes in like, say, the number 2. It goes into the machine. The machine squares it. The square of 2 is 4, so it takes that 2 and it spits out a 4. And then out of it comes the output. And the output is going to live in a different math word. We're going to call it the range. So the domain is going to be the input values or the set, if you will, of possible inputs. And the range is going to be the set of possible outputs. And so I can think that 3 comes in, it squares, and 9 goes out, and minus 1 comes in, and 1 goes out, and so forth. And then the two sort of properties that I want my function to have is I want it to do something. I want it to do something to every input. Or at least every input in my domain. Uh, for example, 
Uh, this is the machine whose domain is going to be numbers. Right? I'm not claiming it's squares an apple or squares a dog or anything like this. If my set is numbers, then it's going to do something to every number. So that's the first property. And then the second property is that it, it does the same thing. If you keep on feeding it the number two, it'll always spit out the number four and never anything else. So there's only this one output for every input. So I'm going to write that there is one output and this is true for every possible input. So one output for every single input. So those are my sort of two intuitive ideas that I want to have in the notion of a function. But let's try to formalize this notion and see if these ideas can be captured.